All right. Thank you for the introduction. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. Uh, tonight we'll be talking about uh, some common shoulder problems, how we treat them, um, and kind of going over some questions at the end. Uh, so if you have some questions, you can submit them to us, and we'll try to get to as many as we can. Um, I'm Michael Lamini. I'm a shoulder and elbow specialist at the CORE Institute, uh, originally from Kansas City. That's where I was uh, born and raised. I did my residency training at the Campbell Clinic in Memphis. I uh, did my fellowship training in shoulder and elbow surgery at the Campbell Clinic, or the, uh, sorry, Cleveland Clinic in uh, Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, and then uh, started out practice in Tucson and been here at the CORE Institute for the last few years. Um, so with that, let's get started here. There we go. So the two big things that I think we should talk about tonight, uh, one is the rotator cuff. We'll talk about what it really is. I think there's a lot of confusion about what it really is, uh, what goes wrong with it, because it's certainly a big spectrum of problems. Um, and as well, we'll talk about what an irreparable tear really is. That, that term is uh, a hot topic within our specialty about how we really treat those at this time. Um, and then in addition, we'll talk about arthritis, we'll talk about what arthritis really is, how we treat it, um, and then then go to Q&A. So the shoulder is like a ball and socket. So on the left side, you see the hip joint. It's, it's truly more like a ball and socket. The shoulder is much shallower. You can see it really, really represents a golf ball sitting on a golf tee. The reason is the shoulder is much more mobile and we don't walk on our shoulders, whereas the hip, it needs to be more stable and it needs to be able to bear our body weight. So the shoulder is predicated on motion and uh, it needs a lot of soft tissues for stability and for movement. So if we looked at a shoulder, uh, this is looking at a shoulder like you were looking in a mirror. All the skin's been removed, but these are the muscles you see. If we go one layer deeper, that's what it looks like here. So the deltoid, this big muscle, the pectoralis, those have all been removed at this point. What you're looking at is the collarbone up top. The triangle is the shoulder blade that sits on the back of your chest. Um, and of course, the arm bone on the side. So the rotator cuff are four muscles that come off the shoulder blade and attach on the top of the arm right about here. Um, and so the four of them are the subscapularis on the front, supraspinatus on the top, infraspinatus and teres minor on the back. And the four of them have a very broad attachment, almost the size of a dollar bill if you lay it all out. So the rotator cuff in total is, is a very big structure, four muscles, very large combined attachment of the four muscles onto the bone. So some of the things that can start to go wrong before we even get to tears and, and what a tear is and what we do, uh, you hear the words bursitis and impingement. So bursitis, uh, the bursa, is a fluid-filled sac between the rotator cuff and the bone above it, which is called the acromion. Uh, we have bursae all throughout our body in certain parts to allow tissues to move against each other without any friction uh, and to allow smooth movement. And so it allows the tendon to move under that bone uh, without causing any problems. And that can get inflamed and irritated. That's called bursitis. Impingement is similar if you develop a little hook or a little spur on the acromion and it can point down towards the rotator cuff. That can irritate the cuff and that's called impingement. Um, similar problems but not exactly the same. Functionally we treat them very similar though. And then tendinitis or rotator cuff sprains that's irritation of the actual tendon, the actual supraspinatus tendon, for example. Um, and most commonly, this tendonitis is not from an injury. Rotator cuff problems most of the time are actually not from injuries, although that certainly can happen as well. It's from wear and tear, overuse, just natural wear and tear that your body should be fixing on a daily basis and sometimes falls behind. And that's really what's happening. That's what we just talked about there. Now, what we've learned actually in the last five or 10 years is that one of the biggest predictors of rotator cuff problems and also who develops arthritis is actually the shape of your shoulder. The bony anatomy and the muscle vectors that it creates uh, is very predictive of who eventually gets rotator cuff problems or who eventually gets arthritis. Not a lot you can do about that, um, but it has been very enlightening for us to really start to understand why people head down one pathway or another. So tendonitis, if we were to get an MRI on the left-hand side, you see the bone in the, in the white. Uh, the gray muscles are uh, similar to that picture we saw. Um, and the muscles become tendons. So the muscle turns into a tendon, tendon attaches on bone. 
The arrow on the left hand side is pointing to a normal rotator cuff tendon right at the attachment. Nice, thick, black, solid structure. Uh, uniform appearance on the MRI. On the right hand side you can see not so uniform. There's some gray signal, white signal within the tendon, but it is intact. So that's what we call tendonitis, tendinosis is another name for that. So these certainly can hurt. Um, they're not structurally detached, but they can hurt. So bursitis impingement and tendinitis, we kind of lump them all together in terms of their treatment. They are basically rotator cuff related pain without a tear. Um, and so what we do often we'll try things like anti-inflammatory medications or NSAIDs, um, things like ibuprofen, naproxen, Aleve, Advil. Uh, we, we might try injections into the shoulder, uh, but physical therapy is certainly very important for a lot of these problems to get better long term. That's how you actually get the rotator cuff to function better, is to actually strengthen it rather than rest it. What if that doesn't work? That works for the majority, but what if those things don't work? That's sometimes when we might consider doing arthroscopy. We go in surgically to go clean up the bursitis and tendonitis. Uh, some people call this a decompression, subacromial decompression. Um, but we reserve this for the people that don't improve with the first line treatments that we just discussed. So for those problems, surgery is for the most part a last resort. I think there's definitely a role for some biologic treatments when it comes to these problems, when it comes to tendonitis, platelet-rich plasma or PRP, um, as well as stem cells, which are two different things, uh, can really help a lot of tendonitis resolve. Um, the issue is, of course, they're not covered by insurance, so these are sort of out-of-pocket costs, but in well-done studies, uh, these things have actually been shown to be effective in the right application. So, a PRP, for example, what PRP really is, is we take your blood, we spin it in a centrifuge so that the layers separate. The top layer has some natural, your own healing factors, growth factors. And those are the things that your body uses to fix problems in your body that you accumulate every day. Uh, we concentrate them, put them back into a site of damage like tendonitis uh, to kickstart the healing process. Might provide a little lubricating effect, uh, might produce some healing. Uh, but for that application, it actually has pretty good evidence. Stem cells um, can do a similar effect. They're, it's harder to make blanket statements about that because there are so many kinds of stem cells. Um, There's so many different sources that we can get stem cells from, uh, including donors, including yourself, um, the way that they're processed. So there's so much variability that it's hard to make some generalized statements with that. Theoretically, they might actually be more beneficial down the road, but we don't know that right now. Um, they often get advertised as cure-all treatments, and, and I think it's, a, it's important to know that they can work in appropriate settings, and if they are used in the wrong setting, they're not going to be effective. Well, that's what's kind of led to some people to have sort of a sour taste with some of these, is that they sometimes got overused for just any source of pain, um, and, and they might not be as effective when they're used in the wrong situation. So next we'll actually talk about rotator cuff tears. So this is further down the spectrum in terms of severity. So we start with tendonitis, bursitis, impingement, and then we get to true rotator cuff tears. But even tears themselves really represent a really large range of damage to the rotator cuff. You can have very small tears, uh, you can have very large tears. But what happens is that the tendon actually pulls off of the bone, typically. There are, some, uh, there are some exceptions to that, but the tendon detaches from the bone. They can be partial, they can be full. Even when they're full, that can range from small to medium to large to massive. So let's look at what that really means. So if we zoom in and we take a slice through the shoulder from one of those earlier images we looked at, partial versus full, partial means that at the worst point of damage, that there's still some rotator cuff attached. So it doesn't mean that there's just some of the entire cuff. It means at the worst site, it's not a complete detachment, meaning it hasn't done that. It started to lift off this way or lift off that way. And so that's a partial thickness tear. Full thickness tear means that at the worst point, it has actually detached and there's a hole between the tendon and the bone. Um, Full thickness tears don't mean the entirety of the cuff. It doesn't mean all four tendons. Full thickness tears can be, you know, a few millimeters wide. They can be very, very small or they can be very, very large. So uh, even within full thickness tears, that's a big spectrum of, of disorders as well. 
So that's when we really get to tear size. So on the left is a probably what most of us would call a medium-sized tear. That hole that you see is a medium-sized tear in the, in the rotator cuff. The one on the right is what most of us would consider to be a massive size tear. Much more of the whole cuff has detached and there's a much, much larger hole than the one on the left-hand side. So other things that matter, it's not just simply is there a tear. We've talked about that. It's not just simply how big the tear is. It's also a question of what the quality of the tissue is like. So these are cross sections. These are slices through the muscles themselves. Um, and so on the left-hand side, what we have circled in red is the actual muscle belly for one of the rotator cuff muscles. It's nice and uniformly gray on that MRI slice. In the middle, you can see it's a little bit smaller. That's what we call atrophy. And it has a few specks of white in it. Those specks of white on this particular image are actually specks of fat. That's called fatty infiltration. Think about it like a marbled steak. Um, muscle that has been detached, especially for long periods of time, uh, can start to get replaced by fat. That's called fatty infiltration. On the right-hand side, you can see much more atrophy, much more fat within the muscle. That's fatty infiltration. That's really important because the fatty infiltration isn't as reversible. Sometimes we are aggressive with certain individuals to prevent that from happening. Sometimes when it's very badly fatty infiltrated, we know that the chance that some sort of repair will work might be less. Uh, so these are all, are all factors that go into what we do. So non-operative treatment um, can still be very effective for a lot of people with rotator cuff tears, even when there's truly a structural tear. Um, the reason is that you know, smaller tears still have a, a very large amount of the rest of the rotator cuff still attached, and there are a lot of other muscles in the shoulder that do similar functions. Um, so if we are going the non-surgical route in a rotator cuff tear, still physical therapy is really the key to long-term long success. Um, and that can be effective for a lot of people, depending on the tear size, the patient's age, um, things that we'll talk about in a minute. Injections can help with temporary relief of the pain. They don't necessarily help anything long-term, but they can help with some temporary pain relief uh, during a period of rehab. Um, PRP and stem cells, we really have very little evidence in the setting of a tear, whether or not that works, whether or not we should be doing it. Um, so we're, we're a little more hesitant to jump to that. It's something to consider still, uh, but a little more hesitant when we're dealing with structural damage as opposed to wear and tear with tendonitis. And then in certain individuals, certain tears, or if the conservative treatment hasn't worked, then that's when we consider doing a repair. So this is an animation that we'll look at here. Uh, is it starting to play for you guys? There we go. Uh, so this is an animation that we'll go through. This is uh, those purple and blue things that you see are cannulas that we have through arthroscopic skin incisions. So skin incisions about that big. We use these portals to get in and out with our instruments. We use a camera to see in there. So that's pointing out the rotator cuff there. That's the humerus, that's your arm bone here and we can stick an instrument in there to start really assessing the tissue. We can put the camera in there to look at the tear if we're actually going to surgery. And so what you see here is that we can put it, um, that's just pointing at the deeper parts of the shoulder into the actual ball and socket. That's all beneath the rotator cuff. So we can put a, an instrument in there to grab the tear, to see how mobile it is, to actually see which direction it really needs to be pulled. Some of them can tear diagonally or just straight back and forth. What we'll do is we'll kind of freshen up the, the footprint to the actual attachment site, uh, and then we start the repair. So we'll put in what are called suture anchors. So people ask, how do you do the repair? How do you get a tendon back to bone? We put in these suture anchors, which are sometimes these screws like this that have the stitches attached to them. Sometimes they're uh, more like a, a drywall anchor or drywall hook. They go inside the bone to get firm fixation. Uh, and then we pull the sutures out to put them into the passing instruments, and that's what you'll see here. So now it's the anchors in the bone, the stitches come out of the anchor, we put them through the, the tendon right there, and then we pull the stitch back through. We pull that out of the way so we can continue passing more anchors, more sutures for however big the tear is, and that's what you see there. And then we start to actually complete the repair, tie down the repair. And so we'll take some of these stitches, sometimes we'll tie them together. Sometimes we put them into another set of anchors. Uh, so this you're gonna see is actually two sets of anchors. That's called a double row repair, for example. 
uh, and you'll see them going in with another anchor here. And now that tendon has been put back on the bone. So that's how we do it. We put in an anchor, pass the stitch through the tendon, and then tie it down or put it into another anchor. And that's what you'll see with the next one, just to pass extra stitches if we have some free corners that we need to capture. You can see that helps there, put it into another anchor and put it into the bone. So that's a fairly routine repair for a medium-sized rotator cuff tear. So this uh, is actually a photograph of uh, a patient. This is a, a medium-sized tear. That metal thing that you can see is just an instrument where I'm holding the tear up so we can actually see how, how big it is. Um, this is nothing huge, nothing small, just a medium-sized tear. And this is what it looks like after we've completed the repair. You can see once we start to move the shoulder around, that tendon is now firmly on the bone. Um, and that's, how, that's what allows us to do some very early gentle stretches in the physical therapy. It's certainly not strong enough to use the arm. It has to be protected to, to allow the tendon to heal, but it's in, the, it's in the right spot. It's held there firmly. So big question, how do we decide what treatments we do for a rotator cuff tear? Which ones we actually treat surgically? Factors that go, go into this, you know, there are many, many factors that really go into that decision. It's not just simply tear equal surgery. One is uh, whether it's acute or chronic, meaning new or old. Um, and similar to that is also whether or not it happened from an injury or happened from just months or year long worth of wear and tear and pain. Uh, so that's one big factor. Another one is the patient age. That's a huge factor. We're more aggressive about fixing tears in younger people than older people for a number of reasons. The younger patients can heal their tear better, so it's more likely to be successful. But also, long-term tears can get bigger. So if somebody, for example, is 70 or 75 years old, we're not worried about what's gonna happen to that shoulder in 50 more years. Whereas if somebody's 40 or 35 years old, which would be very young for a rotator cuff tear, we do worry what's gonna happen decades down the road to that shoulder. The tears can enlarge long-term, not very quickly, not in a matter of months, uh, but long-term they can enlarge. So age is a very important factor. Tear size, uh, bigger tears can get even bigger. Smaller ones typically don't enlarge or don't enlarge as quickly. Tissue quality, as I mentioned, is very important because we know that if we repair those muscles that have really bad fatty infiltration that we mentioned, for example, um, the muscle behind the tendon is not, not as good. It's like putting new tires on a bad engine, right? If the engine's not good, the tires aren't gonna fix that, that engine. So th those are other factors that are important. Patient's activity level, very important. So people who have very demanding jobs, they wanna be very active, more likely to be more aggressive, whereas patients who don't have as much physical demand, um, they may not need the shoulder to do as much for them. So now that we've talked about tears, what they are, how we treat them, the next really big hot topic of the day in modern day is really what we do with the irreparable tear. Irreparable means that it can't be fixed. And that's, that's certainly a gray interpretation, but you know, many uh, patients we see or say that they were told by somebody it couldn't be fixed. There are some that just truly cannot be fixed. We, we could try to release all the scar tissue, pull on the tendon as much as we can, and, and it would be so large and so retracted, it might not reach the attachment site. So that's truly irreparable if it can't be reattached. There are also some that probably shouldn't be reattached um, because the risk of it failing is so high. So even if we could, the quality of the tissue is not good enough to hold onto the stitches. Uh, the quality of the bone isn't enough to hold the anchors, things of that nature. So irreparable is truly not possible or irreparable is a group of patients that maybe the risk is not worth taking, for example. And then we start to think about another set of treatments. So it doesn't mean that nothing can be done. If it's irreparable, there's still almost always something we can do. It's just not a simple repair. It's alternative treatments for that. Um, the reason it's such a hot topic now is because we have many more treatments for the irreparable massive tears than we had even 10 years ago, but especially 20, 30, 40 years ago, we had very, very limited options for, for patients with these tears. So we'll go through each of these. We have a few quick animations. Superior capsular reconstruction is using some cadaver tissue to help fill in the gap between the irreparable tendon and the bone. 
Uh, we'll look at what that looks like. Tendon transfers, or we use expendable tendons from other parts of the shoulder to reposition them into the spot of the rotator cuff to recreate that function. And we take them in a way that still they might supply similar function or they also had a buddy muscle that did that similar function. So we're not doing things to sacrifice one function for another. It's expendable things uh, that we can reinsert a new muscle into the cuff to reapply that function. Um, another one is uh, actually not even FDA approved in the United States. That's a subacromial spacer. It's been in uh, Europe for about a decade at this point. Um, it is a very intriguing option that we're, we're expecting sometime later this year or next year. The, the study has been done, it's been presented, it's not FDA approved, so a big asterisk there. And then another is the shoulder replacement. So at the end of the day, even the worst tears can be treated with the shoulder replacement with a very good outcome. So this we just talked about, what really irreparable means. So how do we know ahead of time that it's irreparable? Because if we're going to do a shoulder replacement, we don't go in there with the scope and try to pull it around and then convert to a replacement. Those are two totally opposite surgeries. So we have to have some predictive ability, and we look at that with the MRI, very much so all those things that we talked about in the MRI. Um, but a huge part of this is the patient factor. So patient's age, you know, the older folks we're more, more likely to do a replacement on because it's very predictable. We want to do one operation that will last hopefully a lifetime and give them good pain relief, good function. Younger patients, we, we really can't do, or we really shouldn't do a replacement in somebody who's in their 30s because it won't last a lifetime, and we need to think about how are we going to salvage the shoulder without a replacement. So age is huge. Activity level is also important because certain activities may be better suited to certain treatments when it comes to these tears. Work and hobbies, just same thing like the activity level. Patient preferences, that's really important because if we, you know, try to shoot a little too far one direction and that's not really what the patient wanted, that leads to an unsatisfactory outcome. So preferences actually really do matter here. So this is an animation looking at a superior capsule reconstruction. We mentioned this earlier. This is a very large tear. You're looking at a big defect right in the middle there, no tendon, but you have tendon on the front and back. So we'll start to put in anchors on both sides of the joint, similar to what we saw earlier. And we go in and measure the distance between these anchors. And we use a piece of cadaver tissue that you see right there and actually put the measurements on that tissue and cut it to the correct size to fit that defect. So now that we have our three and subsequently our fourth side measured out there, then we can cut the graft to the right size. And then we can pull these sutures out arthroscopically put them through the, the graft tissue, the ca cadaver tissue, donated tissue, start to provisionally tie some of this down, and then we can actually shuttle this in all arthroscopically. And that's what it looks like there. And then we complete the repair, tie down the remaining sutures, put in a few more anchors if that's necessary. But that leaves us in an arthroscopic treatment for some of these irreparable tears that we don't want to jump to a replacement for. So another one is a, a tendon transfer. So this is a video from uh, Joaquin Sanchez Sotelo uh, from Minnesota. Um, this is a tendon transfer called the lower trapezius. So the lower trapezius is a muscle way back here on the back of your shoulder blade um, that when we put it back into the shoulder in the right position, or in a different position, I should say, it can recreate some of the lost function from, an, from a massive rotator cuff tear. And so that's what it looks like here. We have to harvest the tendon, meaning we actually have to grab the tendon through an open incision, uh, but we'll get, grab the end of that tendon like this. We'll free it up, make sure it's nice and free and flexible so that it has some mobility to it. And then we Temporarily, we'll put that out of the way. And what we do is we take, again, a piece of cadaver tissue just because that one tendon you just saw won't reach all the way in. So we use a cadaver tissue. We put this into the joint arthroscopically. So this part is done arthroscopically. So you can see now we pull it in all the way into the deepest part of the shoulder into the rotator cuff defect. And then we complete the repair using some suture anchors like we've seen in some of the other videos.
And so now the graft is actually fixed to the humerus, and that's in the position of the absent cuff. We'll tie the remaining cuff into that to try to reinforce the repair and maximize what we can out of the native tissue, meaning your own tissue. And then we connect the graft to that tendon in the same line as your absent rotator cuff. And so that recreates the function of what was missing. So that's another option in certain situations. You know, some tears are best treated with the tendon transfer. Some are best treated with that superior capsular reconstruction. There are different kinds of tears. And this is the balloon. This is the in-space balloon from a company called Orthospace, now owned by Stryker. So this is inserted into the shoulder. And it has this uh, handle that can put in this balloon into the head, into the joint. And what you'll, if you watch the head, if you watch the humeral head really carefully here, when you inflate this balloon, it expands and it occupies the space of the, of the rotator cuff, but the humeral head just went downward. So it depresses the humeral head. That's a really critical component of this. It's actually a really critical component of all the other soft tissue procedures as well. Um, the rotator cuff at the end of the day needs to keep the humeral head down into the joint. For massive tears, the humeral head will start to go upwards and the rest of the shoulder, rest of the shoulder muscles become dysfunctional. So that spacer will keep it down and allow the other, shoulder function, the other shoulder muscles to function the way that they're meant to function. This is another arthroscopic procedure. This is actually very intriguing to us because it's very low morbidity, meaning the risks, the complexity of this compared to what we just saw with the other ones is much less. It's a much faster operation so that you're not asleep under anesthesia for as long. Um, risk profile is much less. Uh, we're still understanding where this fits in. So it's just another tool in our tool bag. And then at the end of the day, even for the worst tears um, or for the patients who don't want to go through those soft tissue procedures, a replacement is a very effective treatment and we'll talk about that more coming up here. So before we really dive into the replacement itself, I think it's really important to understand who does shoulder replacements. It's very unique. It doesn't follow the rules of a lot of other medicine, a lot of other orthopedics. In medicine, volume matters. Frankly, in life, volume matters. You want people to do things that they do frequently and to do well. Um, and that's especially true in shoulder replacements. So high volume surgeons and high volume centers, both are important, have fewer reoperations. They have decreased costs. They have shorter surgery times, shorter hospital stays, fewer fractures during the replacements and fewer transfusions. So basically in every possible way, if you have somebody doing it frequently, they will do it better. So in hip and knee replacements in the United States, we do about a million hip and knee replacements a year. Um, so a high volume surgeon is somebody who does probably more than 50 or 100, maybe even more than that. So a pretty large number a year puts you into the category of high volume for hip and knee. For the shoulder, we do about 100 or 200,000 shoulder replacements a year. And because they're not as common, the high volume thresholds that we use when we categorize these are very different. So if you do more than 10 or 25 a year, depending on what source you look at, you're considered high volume, top tier in terms of volume. That being said, even in 2020, two thirds of shoulder replacements are done by low volume surgeons. So that means two thirds of the shoulder replacements done in the United States are done by surgeons who do less than 10 a year which when you really think about it, is actually quite staggering. We know that higher volume surgeons will do a safer, better job at a decreased cost, delivering better value to the patient, delivering better value to the healthcare system, but for some reason it hasn't held true in the shoulder. So for that matter, you know, all of our shoulder surgeons, all of our surgeons who do replacements here are all high volume surgeons. We do not have any surgeons that do one or two a year. Uh, we specialize in what we do and, and we try to deliver the best care as a result. So shoulder arthritis, um, we'll come back to the reverse in a minute, but shoulder arthritis, that's what a, a normal x-ray of a shoulder should look like. That's a ball in a socket like we saw earlier. When it becomes arthritic, it does not look like a goat yet. It looks like this, it's very eroded. It becomes bone on bone and develops a very large bone spur off the bottom of the ball. And, and it looks like the beard of a goat, we call it a goat's beard bone spur. Goat's beard osteophyte is the name for it. Um, but you get erosion of the cartilage, which causes it to become bone on bone. So arthritis really translates to loss of cartilage, like wearing down the treads on your tires. 
Um, and, and it's the absence of cartilage that is the definition of arthritis. So people sometimes ask about, is it possible to just go clean it up? Well, it's not the presence of something that's the problem, it's the absence of something that's the problem. So with shoulder arthritis, the end stage treatment when it becomes bad enough uh, is doing a shoulder replacement, just like a hip replacement, just like a knee replacement, you end up with a metal on plastic joint. Um, there's no metal on metal on the shoulder and even in the hips that's becoming a thing of the past. So shoulder replacements, shoulders, hips and knees, uh, shoulder, hip and knee replacements are three of the most successful surgeries that we have in orthopedics and frankly in medicine in terms of the effect that it has on somebody's quality of life. Somebody with end-stage arthritis is actually very debilitated by that. Some people will say, oh, it's only arthritis. Well, arthritis is actually probably one of the more debilitating things that can happen to a joint. Very painful, very limited range of motion, uh, very poor function. So the patients who are really at that stage where they're ready for a replacement are actually quite dysfunctional. And so when you give somebody pain relief, you give somebody better motion, better strength, better function, that's a major impact on somebody's quality of life. And when we measure that out, joint replacements are, end up being some of the most impactful, valuable treatments we have in medicine. So what to expect? I would say probably 90% of people end up with a good or excellent result. That means they tell me six months or a year down the road that it is normal or close to normal. Um, maybe a little bit of pain when you overdo it is, is okay, uh, but most people would say they're very happy with their result. Maybe 5%, 10% would say they're not as happy and it's either a fair or a worse result. Um, some of that can be from un, un, unexpected, sorry, uh, too high expectations. Um, which is part of the reason we try to avoid them in younger patients because it is prosthetic. It is not as good of, as an 18-year-old's shoulder. So putting a shoulder replacement into an 18-year-old is not going to meet that person's expectations. Um, the other issues that can lead to dissatisfaction are, are patients who get a complication, which can and do happen. Uh, we minimize them. We, we do a lot of shoulder replacements to, min to make them safer. Um, but, but they can happen. It is a joint replacement, it is a major operation. So looking at some older textbooks, older videos, you see incisions for a shoulder mapped out something like this for a replacement, something like that on top of the shoulder. The reality is in modern day, it looks something more like this. They're usually not these huge, gigantic incisions. Um, and this is an x-ray of an arthritic shoulder. You see that very large bone spur. You see that it's bone on bone. The ball is, is immediately up against the socket. And if you look really carefully, the x-ray on the right is looking up through the armpit this way. And what you'll see is that the ball has actually eroded into the socket and has actually eroded away the back half of the socket. This is very common. This actually happens in about 40 to 60% of people with shoulder arthritis that they get this eccentric or uneven wear on the bone. It presents some challenges surgically for us, but uh, our ability to manage this has come a long way in the last decade. So that's what it looks like on the CAT scan. And we can even turn this into a three-dimensional model to rotate it around and understand the deformity that we see in that socket. Once we do that, the next step is actually virtually doing the surgery. So this is, in a way, like a flight simulator. In a way, it's trial without error. We're trying to figure out what we need to do for that patient before we do the surgery. And so right there, if we try to put in a socket with full support on the back side of it. In this patient, you can see it, it's very deep into that socket. We end up removing a lot of bone. The soft tissues end up being at abnormal lengths. Um, and that's why these particular patients are, are sometimes challenging to, to replace. What we've come to realize is that we can use the implant to build up that erosion. And this is where we really get to trial and figure out to see what, what angle we want to put the implant at. And this particular implant is built up on the back side. And you can see that it's much thicker on the back, which is the bottom of the screen, uh, than it is on the front side, which is the top of the screen. So now with the buildup, it brings the joint back to its original position that that patient was born with, trying to recreate their normal anatomy, their normal shoulder. So that's all nice, but how do we actually do that in the surgery? How do we get down to a few degrees of accuracy, a few millimeters of accuracy, and that's where we use things like a patient-specific instrument. Uh, we're not quite to the stage where we have robotics in the shoulder yet, although that's a sort of a next generation thing coming down the road, but uh, using a PSI or a patient-specific instrument 
helps us recreate the plan. So we go in virtually, plan out the surgery, say that's where I want the replacement to go. We order a guide that helps us put it in in that exact position down to about a millimeter of accuracy, one or two degrees of accuracy. So we can recreate what we planned to do. So a lot of confusion about the different kinds of replacements. So now we're coming back to the reverse that we mentioned earlier, that shoulder replacement we mentioned earlier. Um, on the left, what you see is something called a total shoulder. The ball and socket, so the metal ball and the plastic socket we put in are shaped and sized just like the ones that end up coming out. Um, the metal stem is really just to hold the ball onto the arm bone, so really the only part that gets uh, truly removed and replaced is, is the ball and a plastic liner goes on the socket. So on the left side again is a total shoulder. On the right side you see that the ball and the socket are actually on opposite sides. That's called a reverse shoulder replacement. Um, the reason we do that has changed over the last 30 years since this has become another tool in our tool bag. So again we come back to the massive cuff tear. So on the left a normal shoulder, on the right the ball is very high in the socket. So on the right that's a patient who has a massive cuff tear. Uh, that ball starts to migrate upwards. And so what we do with the reverse, th these patients, by the way, when the, when the ball migrates upwards like this and the cuff isn't holding it down, when they fire the other muscles like the deltoid, instead of rotating the arm this way, what it does is it ends up pulling the, the ball even higher and it just keeps doing this. So that looks like somebody who does this. They, they aren't even able to raise their arm if the massive tear is actually large enough. And that's what somebody might look like who has an x-ray like the one we just saw. So a reverse replacement, because the ball and socket are flipped, it keeps the head down, it keeps it fixed into a new fulcrum. So these other big muscles can then rotate your arm upwards again so it restores the ability to raise your arm. If we do a total shoulder for that patient, the muscle function is still the exact same as the original shoulder, um, meaning if you don't have a rotator cuff before a total, you won't have a rotator cuff after a total, uh, and so the function doesn't get any better. To get the total shoulder, you need a, a, a functioning rotator cuff. To get a reverse, you can do that without a rotator cuff. In fact, it was designed for massively cuff deficient shoulders. So originally it was for what's called cuff tear arthropathy. Arthritis and significant deficiency of the cuff. What we realized is that there are a lot of other reasons to do a reverse and it's very successful. So massive cuff tears even without arthritis do very well with a reverse arthroplasty. Arthroplasty means replacement by the way. So the reverse replacement does very well for the massive tears even without arthritis. It does well for those very, very eroded sockets where the plastic isn't enough to build it back up. It works for very bad fractures where we don't think fixing it with plates and screws would be enough to hold those very fragile bones. Uh, rheumatoid arthritis, because we can't, in, in rheumatoids the disease, the rheumatoid arthritis disease can actually affect the soft tissues and the joint, whereas osteoarthritis, which means wear and tear arthritis, usually affects just the joint, not the soft tissues. So rheumatoids often have arthritis and cuff disease as well. So reverse works very well, very well in that situation. Um, and then another big source of, um, big reason to do reverse is in revision replacements. Uh, people who have failed replacements that need another replacement put back in, um, almost always at this point end up being reverse arthroplasties because the soft tissues aren't functioning well enough to support a, a standard shoulder. So there's a lot of confusion also about what to expect after a reverse. I, I've hear, I hear patients sometimes say, my neighbor had a reverse and the function is, you know, sort of mediocre, if you will. They can only get to about here, uh, things of that nature. The reason you get the reverse heavily influences the outcome that you get, meaning that the patients with arthritis, the patients with massive cuff tears are the best results with the reverse. They get very good function, very good pain relief. People who have had a third or fourth failed shoulder replacement, um, the shoulder is not quite the same at that point when they've had many operations um, and we're just trying to give somebody a reasonable amount of pain relief and function, they're not going to be able to do this after a fourth time shoulder replacement. They might get overhead still typically, but, but not quite as good a function. So the reason you get the replacement heavily influences the outcome you get from that replacement. So if that's all true, why don't we just do a reverse for everybody? 
Um, the reason is that if you can get a total, um, the total shoulder provides the best function for most people. Not, not everybody, but for most people. Um, the parts are shaped and sized just like the normal parts. Uh, it does require a normal rotator cuff, but the function is more normal with the total than it is with a reverse. Um, but because of all the reasons that we do a reverse, we do far, met, far more reverses uh, at this point than we do totals. Um, in fact, since 2013, reverses have become more common every year than the total has. So uh, with that, we'll go to questions. i uh, be happy to go through some questions about some of the things that we discussed, rotator cuff problems, shoulder arthritis, shoulder replacements. With uh, rotator cuff tears, uh, patients frequently come in with an MRI that says that they have a tear and they are expecting to be told that they need to have surgery. And it's definitely not a universal thing. In fact, many rotator cuff problems, many rotator cuff tears, especially the smaller ones, the partial ones, um, are very effectively treated non-surgically. Um, but again, it really comes down to a lot of the factors we talked about, age, the tear quality, the tear size, how long it's been there, what other treatments the patient may have been through already. Uh, so for, for a patient who has failed to improve conservatively, then certainly we're going to be considering repair. Um, for somebody with a very small tear, uh, partial tear, um, that came in for the first time with no treatment so far, we may discuss those conservative things first. So it is, is definitely not a universal path to surgery. As of 2020, no. Uh, so in terms of stem cells and PRP and biologic treatments, getting a tear to heal just by itself, meaning I walk in with a tear and I get a stem cell injection, we don't have any evidence that that can actually get the tendon to regrow back to the bone. Um, in the setting of a repair, so at the time of surgery, that's a different story. In fact, there's some growing evidence that if we inject some of those things, at a repair site that's already starting to heal where the tendon has been physically reattached at the time of surgery, it can maybe help that tendon heal better, help it heal stronger, make it less likely to fail down the road. Um, but just by itself, they don't actually regrow tendons or get it to reattach, but it may help at the time of a repair. That's still something we're investigating and, and will require a lot more effort for us to understand. Yeah, when it comes to what age is too young, or too old for that matter, but what age is too young uh, for a shoulder replacement, that has changed significantly in the last few decades. Um, same thing for the hip and the knee for that matter, that answer about who's too young to get it has changed significantly. Um, and also what we allow our patients to do with replacements has changed significantly as well. So at 68, I would say that's actually a very average age for our shoulder replacements. Um, I'd say the majority of people are in their 50s, 60s, and 70s that are getting a shoulder replacement. Um, 50s, a little on the young side, but not so young that you can't have it done. Maybe into the 40s, we start to really uh, maybe try to push some of the non-replacement options that may exist for that patient. Uh, but 50s, 60s, 70s is almost routine at this point to get a replacement. Um, and in terms of the activity that you can do with that replacement, Honestly, most people with a replacement want to go back to doing the things that they want to do. If you want to go back to tennis, if you want to go back to exercising, um, working out in the gym, um, most patients are able to go back to those things. Golf, for that matter. In fact, a lot of patients actually shave a few, a few points off their handicap after a replacement. Um, so, but an issue of how much is too much? Right? Is there a weight limit of what I can do with my replacement? Not really, and if there is, we don't really know if that exists. So we sometimes may tell a patient, don't lift more than X amount of pounds, whether that's 20 or 50 or hard to really know because we have no science to back that up. Um, but what we're seeing is actually that the replacements are actually quite durable. Um, so people who don't follow the precautions end up still doing fine. Uh, so we don't really know if there is a true too much is, you know, how, how much is too much. Now, within reason, I usually tell people don't try to pick up bodybuilding after your replacement. You know, don't go back to bench pressing 300 plus pounds after your replacement. 
not because it's going to cause something catastrophic, but the harder you beat up the replacement, the faster it may wear out. The same way that you drive your car harder, it's going to wear out faster. That's true for a replacement. In fact, that's true for your, your own native shoulder that you were born with. The harder you beat it up, the faster you wear it out. So no black and white cutoff, um, but it's a within reason expectation. Yeah, in terms of conservative treatment of rotator cuff problems, whether that's the tendonitis, bursitis, impingement group, or if we're talking about the true tears, the, the, the rotator cuff tears that for whatever reason we went the non-surgical route, there's pretty good evidence that says that patients, if we give them a window for when they decide that they have failed, frequently at around six or eight weeks, patients know the trajectory that they're on meaning that six or eight weeks down the road worth of physical therapy, you'll know the direction you're headed. If you're getting better, you may just want to continue. Um, patients who are on that route may need more than six weeks, but by then you kind of know where you're going. So it doesn't require months and months and months worth of rehab to really figure out what's going to happen. You don't need to do it for a year to find out if it works. Um, I think by six, maybe 12 weeks on the long end, people will tell me very clearly this is helping, I'm gonna continue, I'm better, I don't wanna do anything else, or this isn't really helping, what's, what's our alternative? And, and I think that's kind of the time frame, six to 12 weeks. So the use of the laser is really new in orthopedics, um, and it's not as rigorously studied, studied in the orthopedic literature and the orthopedic research. Um, I think we've been a little hesitant to bring it on because we don't really understand how it's working. Um, so I think there probably might be some role for it down the, roll, down the road, uh, but as of right now, I don't think I'd be able to tell you or quote you research that would say that it works. It doesn't mean that it won't work or that we won't, we won't find that out down the road, but as of right now, I'd say I, I don't know. So this is a great question, actually. A lot of patients, when I show them where a tear is on an x-ray, or show them where the arthritis is on an x-ray, show them where the tear is on an MRI, um, these problems end up being here. The ball and socket are between my fingers. The rotator cuff attachment is under my finger here. Almost nobody points to that area when they're telling me where their pain is. The pain from the joint is often felt in a very large area across the shoulder. The pain from a rotator cuff is even more further referred, meaning Patients with a tear here will tell me they feel that pain all the way down towards the elbow. So it's the side of the arm that you feel that pain from, from the joint, from the rotator cuff. Other parts of the shoulder can refer pain elsewhere, but those two main problems almost always are right in here. It's, it's arm pain rather than shoulder pain. Um, another one of those things that we don't know, I think if you're going the PRP route for something like tendonitis, more may be better, but it comes at a cost, and so more is not necessarily easy to do uh, because it is an out-of-pocket expense. So um, some providers may offer a round of three injections or something like that over the course of a few weeks or a few months to really get that biologic response kick-started. Um, and that has some evidence to support it in the knee, for example. But also doing one at a time and seeing how it goes, and if it's incomplete relief, maybe doing a second uh, down the road is also another sort of approach. So some providers believe in doing a round at once. Some people believe in doing one at a time. Um, I think either would be reasonable, but there's no black and white answer for that. Yeah, noise in the shoulder can be from a lot of different things. Um, Tendonitis and bursitis and impingement by itself is enough to cause noise. Um, and that noise can even be painful, grinding, crackling. Uh, certainly arthritic joints universally have noise because that joint surface is no longer smooth and, and lubricated. It's rough like a cobblestone road. And so as it goes back and forth, you will feel and hear noise. Uh, so arthritis, I would say it's universal for them. Even for tendonitis, uh, it's very common. For tears, the actual edge of the tendon uh, can get caught as you go back and forth. Um, but even then, you could have problems even outside of what we've talked about. The AC joint where your collarbone 
meets the rest of your shoulder. That's called the acromioclavicular joint, the AC joint. Um, people can get damaged there. That can cause noise as you move your arm back and forth. So a lot of different reasons. It really depends on the underlying uh, problem once we evaluate it. Yeah, length of recovery, very important thing, deciding if you want to do it, when you want to do it. Um, and the length of the recovery for a replacement depends on which part we're talking about. If we're talking about good use of the arm, being able to raise it well and having good strength, getting back to your hobbies, getting back to work, um, playing golf again, playing tennis, I'd say most people are getting back to even physical things after a replacement at the soonest around three or four months and usually by six months. So I usually tell people around four to six months is the return, a good return of function, pretty good function. You'll still get better out to a year, uh, but the majority in the first four to six months. Pain relief, however, comes much faster than that. In fact, a lot of patients that we see even at the two week visit after a replacement start to say that they already had less pain than they did before the surgery. Not universally, but I'd say the majority by two weeks have less pain than they did with their end stage arthritis. Yeah, calcific tendonitis, so we skipped over that. That is a form of rotator cuff tendonitis where the body lays down calcium in the tendon. Generally, we end up treating it in the same group of problems as the tendonitis, bursitis, impingement, the non-torn problems. Um, physical therapy is important. We might do injections, but the question was about the use of lavage. What, what can be done is using uh, some sort of imaging like an x-ray or an ultrasound or a CAT scan. You can actually put a needle into the calcium deposit, use a little bit of sterile saline or water to flush it out and pull it out with another needle um, to remove the calcium deposit. Um, that's definitely something that we consider um, I don't always jump to that as a first line treatment because therapy, injections, the kind of routine things work for the majority. Uh, but if people are slow to improve with calcific tendonitis, um, that's something that we start to consider uh, sort of as a next stage treatment to try to remove the calcium deposit because that by itself can be painful. Very common problem. Frozen shoulder is a very common problem. We didn't talk about it at all. Uh, very different than the things that we discussed. In fact, it's maybe even more debilitating than the things that we discussed. So uh, a frozen shoulder is when the joint capsule that holds the ball and socket together for whatever reason became inflamed, becomes very tight and very painful, very painful. In fact, the way people start to describe their pain to me when they're sitting in the office for the first time you can almost get a sense that we're probably going to be talking about a frozen shoulder by how severe and, and gnawing that pain is. Um, most commonly, the most common reason to get a frozen shoulder is no reason, meaning that it just comes on out of the blue, comes on randomly. We call that idiopathic in medicine, meaning we have no reason for why it happened. Um, that's the most common reason. It is more common in diabetics, especially if the diabetes isn't well controlled. So there is a strange chemical biological connection between uncontrolled diabetes and a frozen shoulder, but plenty of people get it without diabetes. Um, injuries can stir it up, you know, if you have a, a sprain, it can set off a frozen shoulder, but definitely the most common reason is actually just no reason out of the blue. So genetics are, I think, important, maybe not in the sense of hair color or eye color, um, in terms of you know, this gene or that gene, but genetics in the sense of how our bodies are formed and developed and how our bones are shaped, we're realizing in the shoulder and the hip, those are two very um, bony dependent joints for the problems they get. Meaning the shape of your shoulder, and not by uh, visual appearance, but the shape of the bones, the angles of the bones, um, the slight subtleties of the bones on the x-ray ha actually have been very predictive of who ends up getting a rotator cuff tear and who ends up getting arthritis. So uh, we can look at the rotator cuff tears and actually realize that their, their bony anatomy and their angles fit very clearly for the most part into one category and into one you know, range of angle measurements. Um, and the arthritic group, it's a very different thing. 
And there's certainly some exceptions. Injuries can make exceptions to those rules. But for the common wear and tear problems, wear and tear, cuff tears, wear and tear, arthritis, um, it's actually been very, very, uh, a very significant impact on those. So shoulder instability is another kind of problem that we can deal with. Um, aside from tears and aside from arthritis, shoulder instability is uh, probably one of the more common things we see in the much younger age group, the teenagers, 20, 30 year olds. Um, from an injury frequently, not always, but from an injury, it can tear some of the stabilizing structures, not the rotator cuff, but something called the labrum. And so if patients get a labral tear, that can cause the shoulder to become unstable. Um, and you can get the sense that it's actually slipping out of socket or truly actually coming out of socket and somebody has to put it back in socket. Um, so instability depends on the situation, whether it came from an injury or not. Some people are just so loose jointed that the shoulder actually can slide a little bit in and out just because of some loose jointedness without actually having a tear. So there are different kinds of shoulder instability that we see. Uh, biceps tendonitis is, is very frequently involved with rotator cuff problems um, because the biceps itself, uh, the muscle that we look at when we look in the mirror is really four or five different muscles um, and one of its attachments goes into the rotator cuff, into the shoulder. That's the long head of the biceps. So the long head of the biceps when people get cuff problems or arthritis or frankly anything in the joint, it very frequently is irritated and can actually be partially uh, abraded or partially torn. Um, it's a very secondary issue compared to the rotator cuff because the cuff is very important for the shoulder function. The biceps is, a, is important in the sense that it generates pain. So it's a, it's a painful problem to have, but it's that part of the biceps isn't that structurally important for the shoulder. So the long head of the biceps doesn't really do much for the shoulder, uh, but it can be a big source of pain. Now to get back to the question of what do we do for it, um, we end up trying to treat the underlying problem, meaning the cuff tendonitis, um, maybe the arthritic shoulder. Um, and we might do injections in and around the biceps as well. We can actually target the injections into that area. Uh, but we end up treating it largely based on the underlying problems that we may have. It can exist in isolation too, and we treat it just like the rotator cuff tendonitis for that matter. Rehab injections, things like that. So cortisone, um, other, other name for it is corticosteroids. Um, it's a group of steroids uh, which include Kenalog, triamcinolone, methylprednisolone, but, but cortisone, corticosteroids are just steroids, um, can be injected into a painful joint truly for pain relief. Um, meaning that instead of taking something by mouth to get the medicine to deliver pain relief to a shoulder, um, we can actually inject a medicine into the shoulder to deliver the pain medicine there and it's, it's more effective that way and you get less side effects in your body. So uh, we do steroid injections into joints that are painful basically to deliver the pain medicine to the site of the problem uh, with less side effects. Um, steroids are, if you think about what ibuprofen does, ibuprofen or naproxen is an NSAID non-steroidal anti-inflammatory. So a steroid is actually even more potent than those. Uh, but we can inject them into the side of a, of a painful joint. In terms of how many you can have, it depends on the problem. Um, people with arthritis were quite liberal about doing injections uh, because even if the steroids might theoretically wear down the joint long term, if it's already arthritic, there's no more concern for we need to protect the joint, right? If it's already arthritic, we just need to help it feel better unless the patient's ready for a replacement. Um, so it depends on the problem. For tendonitis, we may try a few here and there, uh, but it shouldn't be the long-term treatment to get an injection time after time after time after time. Um, an important thing is to make sure that they're spaced out. Uh, we generally like, like to wait a few months between one injection and another um, to let the effect of it wear off, to let the tissue sort of recover from the steroids kind of softening things a little bit. So time is important to try to space them out. It can if it's very extreme, but generally speaking, a lot of the patients who are getting 
a shoulder replacement are in the older age groups, and so they do have some relatively soft bones. So osteoporosis, let's back up a second. Osteoporosis uh, means that the density or the strength of the bone is getting weaker. So that's a separate problem from arthritis. That's not, uh, the, uh, not the same problem. So if the bones are soft, the implants that we need to put in may not have as much bone to hold on to, or the fixation might not be as strong. Generally speaking, for 99% of the replacements, um, some relatively soft bone is almost routine. Uh, so it's really not an issue unless it's very, very extremely osteoporotic, um, in which case sometimes we might need to adjust how we do it, um, what the risk of it succeeding might be. Uh, so in those really extreme situations, uh, we might have a different conversation about it, but that's really infrequent that that comes up. I think what you what you want to see is to what feels better. So if you use a computer, you're at a desk a lot, certainly a lot of it are, a lot of us are at computers these days with, with the pandemic, we're sitting in front of, front of a screen for hours at a time. Um, what you, if you notice that your shoulder is getting sore from having your arm at a certain height, you can raise your chair, raise your table, lower your chair, lower your table to find a little more neutral position for your shoulders rather than sort of being hunched up like this or reaching far away. Um, but it's more about just whatever feels comfortable for you, and, and that can be different for every individual. So pain between the shoulder blades can actually be from the shoulder. Pain between the shoulder blades can also be referred pain from the neck into that area. Um, so that's a site of overlapping pain. So sometimes it's hard to know which of those is really the source. Um, typically, if it's really the shoulder that's causing that pain, uh, it's the muscles around the shoulder blade being relatively weak. Um, doesn't mean that they're truly weak, but relatively weak, something we call scapular dyskinesis. And so what we do for that is actually rehab those muscles and strengthen those muscles, uh, which again kind of brings us back to physical therapy as you kind of catch from my talk. Uh, PT, rehab, exercises are, are a significant part of our treatment for a lot of our shoulder problems. Um, and that's what can be very effective to help stabilize and support the, the scapula and the shoulder blade. Um, it could be from a number of reasons. So stiffness in the shoulder could be from arthritis. You know, people who get arthritis get very stiff uh, in their shoulder because the tissue scars down, the bone spurs will literally run into each other so it may not be able to rotate as far to get behind the back. Um, patients with rotator cuff tears that affect the front part of the rotator cuff rather than the top uh, will lose a little bit of their internal rotation strength. So the strength that's required to get the hand behind the back uh, may be affected with certain rotator cuff tears. Um, frozen shoulders, pa patients with frozen shoulders almost universally can't get behind their back because it's so painful and stiff. Uh, so there could be a number of reasons. It depends on the underlying problem.